I beat McGrath and then go through the outdoor season. I win that championship, switch over to Honda. And there was an exhibition race at uh, Las Vegas, at the MGM Grand called the US Open. And um, the Supercross promoters at the time for opening ceremonies, they had this <laughs> great idea about how they were gonna drop me down in like this um, king's chair and I'm wearing a gown and cape and just basically poo-pooing McGrath, the king of Supercross. <laughs> and from that point on, I mean, if they could have thrown rotten tomatoes at me, they probably would have. So it was rough. It was rough. I, I, I'd say 2002, 2003 was really, really rough from a fan's perspective because I think that they had this perception of I was some cocky dude and yeah, I finally beat McGrath and oh, you sold out, you you won this championship for Kawasaki and then you just went to the highest bidder with Honda and that really wasn't the case, but um, I couldn't, I, I mean, it didn't matter whatever I said, they, they weren't listening. What's it like being not liked to that level? It sucks uh, not being liked yeah. at the top level, especially when you didn't do anything wrong yeah. and I didn't want to come down in that uh, cape and gown um, uh, that uh, that they had me coming down in at the U.S. Open, and I was I was still pretty young at the time, and I didn't stick up for myself. Mm -hmm. And like I told him, like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. that looks, it's like too cocky. Like, no, it'll be cool. You're the new guy. You beat the king. I'm like, I don't know. And like, no, nah, let's just do it. So they did it. And uh, anyhow, I can't I can't turn back the clock, but it sucked because it was, you know, I just kept saying, I'm like, man, like, what did I do wrong? You know, and so anyhow, it was it was a tough pill to swallow just because, yeah, like I said, I, I had done everything right that I had thought. You know, you talk about like, I didn't do anything wrong. People reacted this way. And, you know, maybe imposter syndrome isn't necessarily the right phrase for it but did you ever have insecurities during that time certainly had some insecurities at that time you know just wondering like i, I mean i was yeah i basically had become the bad guy i uh, couldn't do anything right uh although i wasn't doing anything wrong on the track just racing hard i was the same guy that they loved yeah i'm coming up through as a youngster a uh, hot little kid coming up you know fun, flashy guy to, guy to ride, throw it out all on the line. And, and that's what they loved about me, I feel like. That's what they used to say. I'm like, man, this guy just goes for it. And that was my type of riding style. And then all of a sudden, just because I changed manufacturers and then I beat McGrath, the same guy they were loving me mm -hmm. and wanting me to beat the year before, now I'm the villain. And so, yeah, it was a, uh, yeah, there were some insecure moments for sure. And just times where I didn't, I didn't even really like going to the races. I was just, there to do my job and outside of that I didn't even really want to be there just because I mean who wants to go somewhere when you're the, like the most hated man on the planet. you're racing against him he's your competitor is he a fun guy to be around <laughs> no no and he and you know i joke now when we're on we're hanging out now i'm like we were in the same race but we weren't necessarily racing each other he was just so good right and he was a lot better than i was and yeah i would line up next to him but i knew my race wasn't really against him he was just he was he was too good for that um but yeah he was the ultimate competitor on and off the bike mentally he wasn't the nicest person to be around. I think he needed that edge. Um, but he also, I think there was this air of insecurity about him mm. always. And, and I always laugh because I'm like, why would this guy ever be insecure? Like he is the best motorcycle racer I've ever seen. But this insecurity about I'm going to lose, everything I have is going to be taken from me. I I'm not going to be the guy that I was projected to be. Like there was always this worry and concern that I think drove him. It drove him to be cold at times, harsh towards his competitors. He didn't have a lot of friends at the racetrack, um, but that's just who he was. And, and I think we respected it. Like I understood where it was coming from, but it didn't make him a lot of fun to be around either. So he had a really tight circle. And if you weren't in that circle, you were, you were an enemy. Like there, were just, there was a really hard line. You're either on his team or off his team. NASCAR, 
there's kind of that saying, when you put your helmet on, you become a different person. You almost have to race like an ass. Yeah. Did you feel like in order to be successful, to be at the level that you ended up achieving with all the accolades, do you have to be an ass to, <laughs> to, to make it to the top on the track? I don't think you gotta be an ass to, to, to win championships and, and to get the performances needed on the track, but I can tell you what you do need to do is you, you have to be selfish, mm -hmm. you do. It has to be all about you. Um, from a, you know, uh, the, the dynamic has changed so much today than what it used to be like in, in, in my day where, you know, a lot of these multi-time champions, you talk about current day, Eli Tomac, two-time champ, Cooper Webb, two-time champ. They have kids, they're married. Um, it was so much different back then. I didn't have my kids until my final season and it was eat, sleep, breathe, supercross, motocross. And you know what? I have to do this today. No, we can't do this. Nope, we're going to this restaurant because I have to eat this. Hey, do you want to go over here on your week on off? Nope, can't do that. Hey, let's go over here. Nope, not doing that. You just, you have to be selfish. Back then, you had to be selfish to be dominant. And um, do I regret it? Of course not, because that's what you had to do. That's crazy, the sacrifices that it takes yeah. to, to be the best. You know, you know the crazy thing, you, you know what's, I try telling people this, like when I've mentored people, like when we had our, Kerry Hart and I had our race team, RCH, and it, it, what I think sometimes gets lost is the sacrifices, you have those small sacrifices that you don't think make a difference, mm. make a difference at this level. And it could be something as easy as during the week, you're done going to, uh, you're done with your practice routine and you just wanna go out and play nine holes of golf. Like, it doesn't seem like it would take away from what you needed to do the next day. Mentally, it might, because you get out there on the, you know, get out, get out there on the golf course. You're not thinking about things. You're just thinking about golf. But walking, swinging, and just the the physical exertion of it, when you could be at home prepping, recovering for the next day, so you can get after it and have a very productive day. It's little stuff like that that at the elite level, those, those, are the, those are the gains that you're looking for. And sometimes people don't realize it until it's too late. Man, you talk about discipline. You have to have the ultimate discipline there. And how, it sounds exhausting just hearing about all those sacrifices, was it exhausting being in that zone for so long? It was, it was really exhausting mentally, mentally taxing being in that zone for so many years. I remember like after each season, as soon as that last race was done, physically, I'm like, I felt the same the, the week after, the day after, but mentally I felt so good. And you didn't realize how mentally taxing it was just being on and, and being that disciplined until you didn't have to be that disciplined, you know, for, for however much downtime you were gonna take off after the season. Coming off of your career, you, you retire, you, you, you call, it, call it a good day. Uh -huh. Is it like, how do you know what to do when this has been your life for so long? Did you struggle with adjusting to not racing? I was very fortunate after my professional career in supercross and motocross that I had a segue. I was able to get into four wheels. Mm -hmm. So it was able to uh, keep me busy. I did, I was like in the four wheel side for three and a half years, three and a half, four years after I had stopped. So that got me till I was 32 years old. So. I was very fortunate in that regard compared to some of the racers. I feel like when they step away, they don't have anything to do or not, not something to fill their love tank up like racing. I was able to do that with four wheels. So that was a really nice segue. Um, so I can't, I, it's so hard for me to speak on, it, it wasn't hard for me to walk away because I had that filler. If I didn't have that filler, maybe we, we'd, we'd be talking about a different story. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, some of that was by design. I was getting offers to and, and opportunities towards the tail end of my career to do the four wheel stuff. And I think maybe 
was that the reason why I exited early? No, but um, it certainly was nice knowing that I had a fallback plan and I wasn't just gonna be sitting at home on the couch twiddling my thumbs.